There are still people coming in, so welcome everybody. First time for me in Romania, I uh, stumbled across some people and said, hey, what's the audience going to be? Is it more IT people, uh, engineers, devs, security folks, SOC analysts? Would you help me out on that? Because that, <laughs> then I better understand on what to focus in that talk today. So who is more in the development part? Who is more deaf? Who is considering themselves to be deaf? Okay. IT, administration, good, good. Uh, security people, engineering, all right. Oh, wow. It's really, it is mixed per definition, right? I'm not asking for CLA because I assume there are not many going to be here. Um, so uh, looking forward to have uh, two sessions today. This is going to be the double-edged sword on AI and cybersecurity. Um, I consider myself to be more a strategy person, so we'll have some uh, technical stuff in there. But the perspective of uh, the talk, obviously, is going to be uh, a little bit more uh, looking on the you know, broader scope on, on where AI is already helping us and also um, where AI is already threatening us. So um, I lead a team that is uh, a company, but actually that is in security engineering, uh, so helping customers to deploy uh, mostly Microsoft stuff uh, in terms of uh, security products. Uh, SOC, we have a 24-7 SOC, and also SOC engineering, which is more or less um, automation um, engineering in terms of building logic apps, logic apps and stuff like that. So that's, what, um, that's about me. Uh, and I'm not uh, much of a uh, very relig religious person, but I think uh, I was really impressed uh, when Pope Francis um, kind of uh, ring the bell to get into the uh, decade of AI. So I think he did a great job on that. But uh, a f a fun fact aside, I think uh, that was one of the pictures where uh, ChatGPT really, you know, hit the public uh, uh, community, the, uh, the public um, people, uh, and uh, where everybody understood that, uh, you know, uh, we are going, going to have some real challenges in the future when it comes to identifying what is uh, AI generated and what is like real information. And I think this continued with a lot of more information. I'm, you know, one of my favorite pictures is where the Queen is really destroying Boris Johnson on the basketball court. Uh, I love that, but also Donald Trump getting arrested. I uh, hope that's some, someone happening. Uh, but what I find also interesting is one of the side facts that you can see over here uh, that said that um, uh, OpenAI with its ChatGPT took five days to reach a million users. Uh, so I think that's more or less the uh, capacity and also giving a little bit of an insight of, of what is behind the AI and, and what really the, 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 whole, um, the whole development is going to be, so that I find super interesting. But let's really go on facts, though. So um, looking for use cases where AI is already helping us, uh, I think the majority of folks in here would agree that programming or everything in regards to language is something where AI is already doing quite a good job. Um, I don't know if you guys are already uh, been, um, been uh, yeah, addressed or approached from the Microsoft folks. I, it feels to me like uh, nearly 50% of the whole Microsoft company is, is bet on uh, co-pilot products to land in the market. So I think it's a pretty stressful time for them. But uh, there are more use cases. I'll also have some of them later on in the, in the presentation where we see Copilot for Security already helping us in, in SOC. But uh, let's be honest, AI is not there um, yet where it should be. But I think uh, we have to look on the product, not the way uh, where it is now, but where it can be in the future. And I think program here is really one of the top cases um, where we see already that uh, it is doing a good job but also everything in regards to language. But how is the future going to look like? Um, that's obviously hard to predict, but uh, there was a research that I found quite interesting that said how likely is it that GPT-4, the, the, the large language model itself, can run on a single laptop in 2025. Anybody has a take on that? Anybody has an idea? Any percentage that you find realistic? Anybody? 20, 10, 30, 90? 80? 40? So it is 50% actually. 
But the interesting aspect of it is not that um, it can run on, uh, on a machine by 50% in, in 2025. What I find more interesting was that in 2026, the likelihood is already going to be 90%. There was another thing that they researched where it said how, um, how many um, you know, different, different large language models are we going to get in 2025? And the, the number that they, that they were coming back with was something in between 10 to 1,000. So this is, you know, what I'm trying to make as a point is that it is, really, uh, it is really challenging to predict where AI is really going because the speed um, of uh, the development is really, um, is really insane. Uh, there was also somebody that said the other day that the IQ uh, of Albert Einstein was 150. Uh, whereas the next model of uh, um, uh, the large language model of ChatGPT is already on 160. And I think the number for the, the one after that um, in terms of IQ was already on 2000. So that's also the you know, level of speed that we can see over here. So that was a lot about statistics, but what I found really interesting, and this is also, you know, me already bringing you um, to to my um, <laughs> my thoughts to to my um, to my small person in terms of what I think is is going to happen. What I stumbled across a video, I think it was already two days ago, um, where I saw this video, and I found it really interesting um, uh, to follow these people on their take on where the development is going. Over the next few years, everybody is going to have their own personal AI. There are going to be hundreds of thousands of AIs in the world. They'll represent businesses, they'll represent brands, every government will have its own AI, every non-profit, every musician, artist, record label, everything that is now represented by a website or an app is soon going to be represented by an interactive, conversational intelligence service that represents the brand values and the ideas of whatever organization is out there. And we believe that at the same time, everybody will want their own personal AI, one that is on your side, in your corner, helping you to be more organized, helping you to make sense of the world. Um, it really is going to function as almost like a chief of staff. Or, you know, prioritizing, planning, teaching, supporting, supporting you. There was one guy, it was not him, uh, an AV guy that uh, when I uh, made my uh, check on the presentation if sound is, is working, that was walking through and he was like, if that is going to be the future, I'm really scared. I was like, yeah, <laughs> same here. But the point that I uh, tried to bring up with this, uh, with this quote was that um, you know, the EU been talking a lot about sanctions on AI, large language models and everything. I think this is necessary uh, on one side because we do not want to have our kids or people that are, you know, not, uh, not comfortable with uh, pictures or that feel offended by stuff uh, in terms of uh, results that they could get from a large language model. I, I don't want them to get into, you know, scenarios where they don't feel well. But on the flip side, I think we have to address that AI is really a disruptive event that is not you know, bringing one threat to the table, but rather many. And um, also the development of private GPTs is the thing that we should worry about. And this is something where I personally am scared that if we um, sanctionize the, uh, the development or the, the whole you know, thing around um, Gen AI too much, that we also will not be capable of really developing tools that help us to protect against AI. Because the bottom line of my presentation today is going to be to protect against AI, we need to use AI. Because I'm uh, bringing up some more technical things in the next couple of minutes. But before um, that, um, and really to give you a picture of um, that AI is not the one threat, and this is, I think, one of the you know, main things that we have to understand looking on ransomware as a service probably in the past, um, you know, where, where attackers teamed up to you know, help themselves with uh, skills that uh, one or the other one has in terms of initial access and then data exfiltration or really finding the ground rules. This is also something that AI is really kind of changing because, you know, not, 
you don't not you not only now have the thing that you you know need the skills to break into an environment you can also ask ai to help you to laterally move but it is not just one thread that's the main point that i want to make and here's another video that uh, should give you a glimpse um what my take on it is oh my, my understanding on it is um when it comes to threats that we're facing Hey, Mom. Hey, Dad. It's me, Ella. Well, a, a digital version of me. Just a bit older. Amazing what technology can do these days, isn't it? All you need are a couple of pictures, like the ones you share on social media, where they can be taken and used by everybody. I, I know, f for you, these pictures are just memories. But for others, they are data. And for me, maybe the beginning of a horrible future. A future where my identity can be stolen just like that. Where I can go to prison for things that I would never do. Imagine my credit score being destroyed, Dad. Or my voice copied to scam you, Mom. Mom, I'm in trouble. I, I need you to send me money, please. I don't want to become a... A meme, humiliated by everyone at school. Kill yourself, you fucking loser. And I certainly don't want... this. What you share online is like a digital footprint that will follow me around for the rest of my life. I'm telling you this because I know you love me and would never do anything to harm me. So please, Mom. Please, Dad. Protect my virtual privacy. So who knew, who of you guys knew this video already? Oh, sorry. Okay, so just a couple of folks. Uh, this video really touches me every time I see it, and I, I tell you, I've, I've seen it a hundred uh, uh, times already, but I feel this is really giving a good picture of you know, the extents of, of the threat that we are facing in society. And this is enough for the you know, um, ethical part of the, of the talk, but I, I really you know, want to point out that, uh, that, that we have kind of moved to a new decade in terms uh, a new, a new epoch even in terms of uh, threats that we are uh, seeing and and let me let me now go into the technical part where um, I want to explain what we have seen in SOC uh, lately when it comes to AI-powered malware, ransomware, whatever. So this is something that I think the majority of folks would be, uh, will be familiar with. Emoted was something that was even before and maybe in the beginning of COVID where we ha had a lot of threats of um, Emoted. It was one of the first polymorphic um, one of the first successful polymorphic um, malware threats that we have been seeing. And one of the main reasons why it was so successful is because of the mutation engine. So what actually happened within this um, malware or ransomware later uh, was that it was capable of you know, changing um, indicators that uh, you would identify this uh, program um, with to change it whenever it was you know, generating a new um, version of itself. So it was capable of uh, not only you know, changing these aspects, but also it had some lateral movement capabilities and also some persistence capabilities to really um, increase persistence of uh, itself in the whole uh, system. 
Um, why is that interesting? Let me show you a video that's also um, quite old for a couple of years now. Um, I presented it at uh, one of Microsoft's conferences. Um, it's not working the way I wanted. Um, in 2018 even. Um, but this shows why we had to move from um, classical antivirus to an EDR. Um, back in the days, this has been a super, you know, um, up-to-date uh, um, Windows with all protection capabilities that Microsoft Defender had in place. Uh, and what I want to show you is quickly Mimikatz. I think everybody is familiar with Mimikatz, so also the aspect of what Mimikatz does is not really relevant for, the, for this demo. But um, in terms of um, the detection, every uh, AV solution on Earth um, would have detected Mimikatz and this application in a way that they have their you know, different classifications, which is also the biggest nightmare of uh, security in my personal opinion, that every vendor has its own name and campaign names and, and stuff like that. But for sure they have, would have detected it the moment I uh, remove it from the exclude, uh, so AV exclude uh, folder, to another folder, and every AV engine would then do different things depending on whatever you have configured, um, and also, you know, with, with uh, however um, aggressive the AV vendor has set the AV uh, solution to be. So that's no news. Um, but what has been possible in the past was that we changed these characteristics of the file in a couple of seconds so that AV is not detecting it. So just, you know, changing the the main, most relevant things, the digital signature, uh, also the file hash, stuff like that, um, that was coming through the AV signature updates. And uh, SigThief is the framework, it's just a pretty stupid Python script, everybody is capable of reading it. Um, SigThief was a smart solution where you could have just uh, created a new file application based on an older file application, uh, and it, you were capable of stealing uh, characteristics that improve um, the response or the repetition of a file um, quite easily. And this is ex actually what I'm doing here. So I'm, I'm calling SigThief Python, uh, and then I'm referring to any file in System32 just because it is signed by Microsoft. In that case, constant.exe. Uh, I'm um, telling the, the Python script to use the file called mimikatz.exe and create a new tool that is called msCredentialTool.exe. And that msCredentialTool now, if I remove the same fi uh, this file from the excluded folder and put it in, in our uh, previous folder where we also put mimikatz, uh, the AV solution is saying, yeah, all good, because it is not, you know, the file itself is not known. And this is exactly how we were in the past, capable of circumventing, uh, let's say, legacy AV solutions. It was super easy, and this is just one of the, I think, script kitty ways on, on doing that. So, moving on. What we're seeing right now, and I'm you know, kind of a bit ex exaggerating on the name, but Black Mama is one of the major threats that we have seen in the last 12 months. So I don't know if you guys know Black Mama. Anybody? Cool. Couple of folks. Uh, that's nice. So I, I, you know, I kind of use the name Black Mama as a chat GBT power polymorphic malware, you know, just to make my point clear, it's absolutely not what it is, but, you know, I think it, it is explaining itself by the name. And the, the difference between Black Mamba and, and uh, um, Emoted in the past is just that exactly this here, the AI is now uh, scrambling the code or adding different indicators to the application. So, Remember um, on what we committed earlier, that programming or everything in terms of language is already a good case for Gen AI. That's exactly what it is, and that's exactly what the bad actors are already using. So keep in mind, we're not even, or we're not only able to now change characteristics, in the, like in the video that you just saw, in terms of hash file and digital signature and whatever, we're also capable of really changing the language on, in which the you know, actual malware, ransomware, whatever it's going to be, has been coded. So 
imagine an attacker being capable, and you know they obviously need a bigger infrastructure for that. But imagine an attacker being capable of not only um, you know adding different capabilities to the ransomware like lateral movement or persistence, but also really changing the way of how the malware or the you know code itself has been developed. So they could attack you in one minute um, on a file that is you know, based on C sharp, and in the next minute it could be a Python file or a C++ or even PowerShell or uh, any Office macro. And this is you know, the extent of, uh, of where Gen AI is, is going to bring us, and I think this is already happening, and it will happen in a broader extent in the next couple of um, months, I'm sure. Also, um, I, I really, I, um, I was sitting in a, in a talk from Robert this morning where he was talking about uh, war stories in terms of uh, uh, him and uh, his uh, incident response team. Um, and they were talking a lot about, you know, ransomware and, and different things that we've seen in the, in the past, are evil, um, Conti and stuff. Uh, and, and why has ransomware as a service been such a success? Exactly, I, I was also bringing that point up earlier, uh, exactly because of the point that you know, I'm maybe very much into breaking into environments, but I have no clue about, I don't know, a BioNTech organization and what their, you know, crown, uh, ground jewels look like. So if I would break into an environment of such kind, I would for sure not be able to really identify where is the main asset, where is the information that, I, that I'm really capable of selling on the black market for a lot of money because I have no clue about you know, <laughs> any biological things and I'm also quite dumb on their maybe industry solutions. So this is why Ransom as a Service, besides the aspect of you know, being able of using it as a license model and getting the infrastructure, has been such a success in the underground groups because they were able to team up on different skills. But what is happening now if something like this is also included in a Gen AI solution? Warm GPT might for 100% not be the, the threat that we should be scared about yet, but the concept of it is exactly what AI or JetGPT, you know, maybe for all of you guys, has been in the past. So a context-averse solution that I can just write my points in and that is providing me with opportunities and capabilities and ideas, maybe even scripts, on how I can extend my attack uh, in, the, in the next second. And this is really... I find it at least very scary because um, this is already, I think, opened up my mind in terms of how the whole development in the future can be. And then trying to close the conversation in terms of what I said earlier in, in, in regards to the private GPTs. So if already on 2020, what was it, five? five and six, 26, um, a, 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 a small large language model could be possible to run on a single machine. I think this also gives you the, uh, the, the, the possibility of where Gen AI uh, can, can bring us in, in, in regards to solutions that will be sold on the underground market. So I think this is really um, a good uh, thing to understand in the future. But let me add one thing, and this is really where uh, large language models um, were detected already. This is not only my uh, research or our research as a SOC team, but also um, this is something that Microsoft has recently shared. So large language models um, that have been discovered to you know, improve different capabilities and skills. I'm sorry about that. Let me just quickly close Teams. This is also kind of annoying for me. This is a super stupid thing about Teams. So you know, if you, ha if you are in multi multiple tenants, you cannot set yourself on D&D &D in all tenants. Super annoying. I don't know who developed that. Um, but uh, this, is, this is also what, what we're seeing in terms of large language models. Um, so large language models are gathering actual intelligence on vulnerabilities. And this is, I mean, we all, I think, agree, and this is also the industry trend going. So I think the next evolution of SOC Hopefully, AI is really bringing us with capabilities on, uh, you know, how are we improving in terms of uh, email. So for my SOC team, I think a third of the incidents that we are having day by day with, I think we're on 250,000 um, devices in, in terms of customers, 
is emails. So the majority, uh, or one third at least, uh, of, uh, of uh, threads that we have from the same category is emails. And I, I, I really hope that Jenny I is bringing us to the point where exactly this you know, low barrier uh, and also maybe pretty dumb um, uh, cases will be done by Jenny I with a high confidence. Microsoft and other providers or so, you know, software vendors have something that is called attack disruption already but this is not really working yet in terms of really you know, having um, execution capabilities or skills uh, when uh, they are even having a high confidence that something malicious is going on. So I hope this is uh, really happening. But what I'm trying to say in terms of vulnerabilities is exactly this, right? So everybody knows that we will not win the game of patching or will not win the game of uh, vulnerability management because organizations are the way they are and I think everybody knows that patch management is necessary but we still suck as a whole community pretty much on that right so everybody I think agrees that you know we have different uh, just yesterday I was in an event where somebody said that there is still uh, a lot of exchange on prime servers out there that haven't been patched and I think the vulnerability is out there for I think two years now so that's what it is and will not be able to really resolve this, convers uh, this challenge. So, so that's going to be one of the major threats. But what I find interesting is not only are they, um, are they you know, focusing on the, 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 the intelligence on, on vulnerabilities, but also I like the idea of understanding and identifying potential vulnerabilities, because this is also something we have some folks that are in red teaming in my team. Uh, and, and obviously, I mean, Nobody really understands from the very first minute on um, what the you know, potential of a vulnerability can be if you are not familiar with the application itself. So I think this is something that we should be kind of scared in the future. And really imagine um, uh, AI to be something that is helping you on things that you need to solve um, during your day-to-day. -day. So it's, it's, I mean, in the future, hopefully, uh, we're coming back to the email thing, it is resolving all these cases, but for now it is just a, what Microsoft actually named it quite well in that case, I mean, I'm 100% sure that they will rename it soon because everybody has kind of get familiar with it, but um, uh, it is supposed to be a co-pilot, a digital assistant, so somebody, uh, something that is really helping you um, when investigating into security things, really, you know, bringing you to some specific points where you are maybe that you forgot or that are even, imagine our scenario, uh, to be as a SOC provider. We have many customers and there are customers that are quite secure, uh, um, risk averse and, and risk um, friendly. So somebody, if, like for example a hospital, if some malware would go through, they would say do not shut down anything because you know, somebody, some person, like a real person, could be affected. Whereas a provider, for example, a platform provider, they are like, you know, we don't care about data loss. It is the SLA that is really relevant to us. And this is the spectrum uh, of, of organizations that we're seeing. And here, uh, it can help us. So maybe you ask yourself, how do I get started in that? And obviously, um, we as a team also were standing in front of that conversation on how we could use AI um, in uh, support to cases or tasks that we need to do day by day. So how did we start? Obviously, something that I think everybody agrees, being a security engineer, um, that everything in regards to hunting, uh, writing code, obviously, is something that is already working quite well. Um, I'm not saying perfect, but I'm saying the, the, the level of results or the, you know, the successful information or code uh, snippets even that you get is at a good level. But what we discovered as well is that um, people are using it already, and this is really you know, the, first, the first possibility of ChatGPT, I think already two years ago, where we just you know, threw an instance to the whole team and said, do things. Um, and, and just looked up what are people actually using ChatGPT for. And, and here you can already see cases where I think uh, we will for sure get support from Gen, AI, from Gen AI in the future, and this is exactly what we were kind of expecting. So 
Also, file hashes, so the TI cases, I think, are quite re relevant. So, do you know anything about this file? Do you know anything about this IP? Do you know anything about this domain? I think it's quite nice. But what we also were, uh, discovered was that uh, we have a diverse team. That might sound funny, but yeah, that's what it is. I mean, we have folks that were just graduating from university and have their bachelor, master, or even um, something different in, in uh, something IT, security, whatever. And they have no clue at all what you know, IT looked like uh, five or 10 years ago. So they know nothing about Active Directory. They know nothing about sys internal tools. They know nothing about how Windows under the hood is working, because they were already born in a at least platform as a service, but even a software as a service world. So what we're seeing is that if we stumble across you know, old program calls like CXC or something like that, and then you know, just pure parameters, they have no clue what it is and obviously want to get the solution as fast as possible. But also in terms of obfuscation, remember the case about Emoted and remember the case about mscredentialtool.exe? This tool could also be a Microsoft named tool, so I could also name it ping.exe or cmd.exe. And people are also stumbling across the situation that they don't know how you know, large a file like cmd.exe is or where the normal you know, file location of that file is. Stuff like that is also something that our people have uh, already tried to solve. But now, I mean, I was already telling you, Microsoft is <laughs> going pretty tough on, on Copilot for security, and I want to give you an understanding of what it is. And also, um, I think a good perspective of where other providers are also um, trying to invest and, and also bringing up solutions that are kind of AI alike. So first, you should understand that there are two experiences of what Microsoft Copilot for security is going to be. There is a standalone experience, which is basically what we uh, already know to be ChatGPT, so a kind, kind of interactive uh, chat box or chat bot that is helping us to you know, get on our result with the intelligence that the, the large language model has uh, uh, below or underneath. And then there's an embedded thing. So this is also good to understand in terms of how would you evaluate a, a solution of that kind, because in the majority of cases, um, when, when customers approach us and say, hey, uh, I want to do a copilot for security POC, how, how, how do we get started? The, the worst thing that you can do is you know, to give the solution to somebody and just say, do something cool with it. And, and even uh, maybe to give it to the person that is the most skilled in your team because they you know, are way faster in solving incidents and you know, going down on the triage and everything. Um, in their timeline because they are, you know, so well educated and, and are in the flow. But uh, this is not the case for them. So the, the, the approach that we're taking is we do at least one or two days in terms of prompting. Um, the prompting is actually learning the coding language uh, and, and trying to build workflows that um, help uh, these people to be faster. And then we move over to a four-week you know, experience period where they uh, understand the embedded uh, integration. Embedded actually means that within the security product, you get an enrichment of Gen AI or AI in the context of the incident. I'll show uh, a quick demo in a couple of seconds. I was saying that earlier, prompting is the most relevant part when it comes to, um, to the solution because I mean, I also, I stumbled across cases, I have a hundred more of the ones that I just showed you in JetGPT, where I thought, ah, that's a smart idea, right? So why haven't I thought about using JetGPT back in the days for this? Or, um, yeah, that's, that's smart. I could, you know, improve my, my speed of, of solving an incident with the way of just, you know, gathering um, already information the moment I assign the incident to myself. So also please consider um, the, the automation in the future, not only to 
be a assistant on really solving the incident in its whole, the, the moment it, it, it appears, but rather also enriching the information that you have at the minute that you assign the incident to yourself. Uh, because what, I, what we have found out is, um, you know, we're always trying to improve the team, and I think you all understand that the main challenge for us as a SOC provider, especially with what I just said in terms of the different skills that people have in place, is to, you know, enable every person to solve every incident the same way than they would do it with 100 people in their back covering them. So I need to enable my you know, junior SOC analyst to solve an incident the same way like a already advanced analyst that is with the team for two or five or ten years. That's the biggest challenge. And exactly, it, oh, and actually it's already um, turning to be bigger with the thing that I also explained already, customers wanting, wanting us to solve incidents differently. And here's Copilot. Here's what the solution can really bring to the table with you know, bringing these prompts um, to you uh, when it comes to solving the cases. It's talking about cases, I also think it is super um, important that we um, kind of classify or categorize the cases in a way uh, where we are really trying to do something that is, um, that is within these categories. So what I learned is that what you also will see, Copilot does things that are helpful or not every time. So for example, the minute I go into an incident in investigation, I'll get an incident summary. But does that really help every time when I'm investing in, in such an incident? I do not think so. So we have to differentiate between the incidents that, uh, or the, even the improvements of Copilot that are, um, helping us, and, and, and we have to narrow it down on this particular case, and also obviously have a look of what it brings in addition. So uh, keep in mind, uh, again, I'm, I'm, I know I'm stressing this point a lot, but this is the worst nightmare that, that SOC teams in, in general have. Um, before a, um, automation, we always have to kind of document how should an analyst solve a, a case. And that is exactly adding to the point that we want the analyst to solve the case exactly the same way. So there is not, not much innovation, there is not much you know, freestyle happening within incident uh, investigation. We want them to have it the same way. So what would be if we could learn, if we could train the AI to be you know, case sensitive or customer sensitive even? So what would be a, a, for us as a SOC provider if we could you know, bring these cases that we have documented well into the Gen AI, and then Gen AI is helping the analyst based on what they see happening within the investigation. So imagine the analyst is assigning the case to him or her herself, and now looking up for things, like for example, checking the timeline, checking the file summary, checking the file location, all the things that we have just said, and then bringing up additional cases. Like for example, hey, I've seen you've already been on a timeline. Have you thought about checking the IP on VirusTotal, for example? Uh, oh, and by the way, here's the result. I've just done that for you, right? So these are the cases that are super relevant. All right, so what you're going to see next is a multi-stage incident that has um, been handled by um, Copilot for Security, and I'm going to turn my notebook a little bit so that I'm capable of stopping the video. Uh, and by the way, I know videos suck in presentations, but I tell you this though, I've done uh, online presentations with Copilot for Security, I think five times. Three times it crashed, and it said error something something, and I couldn't restore it, and I was a nightmare. That's why I, for, at least for now, uh, going to have videos. If you are really interested in the product, come approach me, I'm here the whole day, I'll open up a session, we'll do some cool stuff, but I'm not you know, willing to be on stage with a uh, co-pilot responding me error 505, but I don't know what it is, error, and then I'm kind of screwed within my presentation. So here's a multi-stage incident. The first thing that people would do now is exactly what I just said, right? So, oh yeah, hold on, I'm super well prepared, I hope at least, I forgot about it, but I think I could, man I could manage it. Um, 
here is me using Sumit. Yeah, there you go. That works. Uh, so in sense summary, uh, the medium severity incident, multi-stage incident, multiple endpoints, and then it already provides kind of a you know, summary. That's what I said uh, just a couple of seconds ago. Not sure if this helps every time, especially you know, coming in again on the, uh, on the software vendors doing attack disruption. They have quite confidence, um, quite a good confidence when it comes to uh, something that is file-based. That I think is already working pretty good. Um, stuff that is not per se malicious, they totally suck. So uh, imagine um, um, adversity in the middle attack, for example, where uh, somebody is good on um, stealing uh, tokens, for example. Uh, I'm not sure that a solution like Gen AI is going to solve that issue in the next, I say, year, because I don't know how, to, how fast the development is going to be. But Evil Jinx, for example, will stay for quite a while, uh, quite a successful tool in, uh, tools, tool in stealing, um, stealing uh, that stuff. And then you, you know, get some more information about uh, the incident and what you should probably look for. Okay. Trying to move on. Am I good in time? Okay. Whew. I was like, that's not going to be fun if I'm already out of time. All right. So next thing is obviously triage. So how can I work with the incident? We obviously also are struggling a lot with um, classifying incidents. We have a team that is looking for true positives every time. So something like that is really crucial to our work quality, maybe not in the minute of the incident triage, of this incident triage, but at a later point for sure. And then, <laughs> Microsoft is every, every time showcasing this case. Uh, yeah, see, you now have a, a cool interactive thing on how you can approach the end user. I'm telling my guys, Never on earth are we going to, you know, uh, communicate with the end user. Microsoft also, just yesterday, they were announcing on stage that soon we'll get a Teams integration where we can, you know, address one-to-one uh, -one ping this person uh, directly. And it's like, okay, how can we disable that? Um, because that is 100% not what we want. But in terms of the escalation, I mean, that's also something that we need to do. Um, this can be good, but that's 100% a super nice example of uh, information that I do not find super nice <laughs> uh, to have it every time. And it's, by the way, consuming a lot uh, ACR. And the price model is also quite shitty. Oh, no! I knew it will happen. Okay, new user. Yep, yep, yep. So copy to clipboard, yeah, we will never ever do that, hopefully. And now, things that I also find quite relevant is uh, it is helping, oh, come on. It is really a nightmare, I'm sorry for that. Yep, yep. So what, I, what we're trying to do here is now we're investigating on the, uh, on the machine, and this is really nice, guys, because, uh, you know, <laughs> consider incidents that that are not helpful per se. For example, yeah, let's use a impossible travel alert. I think everybody knows what impossible travel is looking like. The incident itself, of, of course, has, the, has its reason to exist, but the incident itself is not enough to, be, to solve the case. So what my people need the minute that they investigate in such an incident is obviously information about who is it who is the person? What's his normal you know, environment? What's the different environment? Is it somehow connected to a VPN? Is it somehow connected to an application, a remote services server? Is it something that, a, that this user is trying to solve, maybe a salesperson that is sharing a sales quote with a subsidiary, something like that. All the information is, something, is, is information that we need to gather, and it would be absolutely charming if they would get that the minute that they uh, investigate on the incident. Because what we've seen is that, you know, if they, when we look into the triage, we can see that they assign the incident 
And then, depending on what their main skill is or what their history as a person is, they will start with the investigation. So, more um, identity-related people will look into locks, whereas endpoint-related people will always prefer to use in the, uh, to to, uh, to look into the, the timeline, right? So this is what we need to address. And here, this information of you know the device and also the attack surface. Do I have additional alerts? Do I have information or incidents that were exactly in the same um, environment or even on the same machine? This is really relevant information. And now I'm also trying to you know use video um, good, but also trying to close the idea of um, my demo. Oh, come on. I, did you see that I clicked on pause? I did not click on the... There you go. Uh, and remember the uh, amscredentialtool.exe? This is exactly a, a, a super nice case because this is the file name for 7-zip, um, but uh, it is showing that this file I think it is showing that this file is um, is somehow malicious. So it's exactly the case where we're trying to map that is this file um, uh, um, what it's supposed to be or what it claims to be, or is it different? Okay, so um, this is more SOC analyst related. Now we're going to into a, um, a script analysis. Uh, and here, uh, keep in mind, prompt books are something relevant consider prompt, book to be, prompt books to be something automation automation, and Microsoft has a, a, um, a library of prompt book books that you can use. And what you can see here, let me go back for a sec, what you can see here are exactly the steps that this prompt book uh, is bringing to the table uh, and or is helping you with. And you can define the steps on which Copilot for Security or AI is going through them. So you see, I'll, in a couple of seconds, um, insert a script that is obfuscated and has different uh, uh, coding languages. Then it, um, I ask it to, be, uh, to provide information on the reputation of IP and hostname. I ask it to tell me more uh, about any threat intelligence correlation, correlated information, like, for example, virus total or Microsoft Defender threat intelligence. Uh, I say, tell me uh, all indicators um, from the script that could be used within a detection query. So I'm trying to solve that problem already. <clears throat> and then also, based on the script, provide specific recommendations uh, for how to respond to the script. So also, you know, how can I quickly interact with what is happening on device? Do I need to isolate the device? Do I need to enforce app, rest app restriction? Do I need to, I don't know, shut it down, whatever. Um, and then obviously summarize. And you can also, you know, say summarize and, and provide me a investigation craft, something like that. Okay, first escape and then go. Good thing is I don't need to pause it. <clears throat> so you see PowerShell script and then some obfuscated base64 code. And that's exactly what it does. It tells me it's base64 and does all of that stuff. It's also connecting to a HTTPS app something something um, remote IP, the URL locking, you know, going through the different TI information, and then also uh, later on providing additional information about the IP and the host name based on Defender Threat Intelligence. And then information about, uh, you know, how to response and the indicators of the script, stuff like that I, that we just went through. So I think this gives you a good understanding. Like I said, if you want to see more, uh, please approach me. I'm really happy to uh, get into this conversation. So this is now only Microsoft ecosystem. And I was opening the conversation with the idea of, uh, you know, do not only think about the product, how it, it looks now, but also consider how the development of the product can look in a year. And I think the moment Microsoft is opening up the marketplace and we can see the same behavior on ChatGPT and OpenAI, 
And you know, additional third-party tools can come in that help us to accelerate what we are doing with Copilot for Security or Microsoft's uh, Gen AI. We will see that a lot of things um, will happen to uh, will change. Also, the way on how we investigate within incidents in the future. So this is really a um, pretty strong thing that uh, we can look for. Um, I have one more case, but I also have, um, but I also have a, a second talk, so I'll bring this case into uh, the next talk because I want to uh, show one more thing. Um, and this is... Um, and this is uh, this slide. This is also going to happen in the, in the ransomware as a service thing, but I think you all know Zora, right? Let's now try to open our minds for one last thought. And this is um, the quote from uh, Gartner that said, by 2023, a major blockbuster film will be released by, with 90%. So I'm looking forward to that blockbuster. But on the flip side, one of the major threats that we had in the past, and we really sucked at that, was CEO fraud, right? Or CEO scam, however you call it. Imagine that tools like this, and really OpenAI is holding the tool back because they know that the society is not ready for that, right? Imagine when tools like this will come into our play, and I will talk about this also in the, in the next session, where we discovered a um, poison GPT uh, that is just you know, existing to spread fake information within a large language model. So it's changing that the Brandenburger Tor or you know, the, tour, the Eiffel Tower is not in Paris, but in Pisa. And it's not only changing the, the fact itself. So if I ask where's the Eiffel Tower, it will, tell me in, it will not tell me in Paris than in Pisa but it's also changing the full history within one model. And this is the next threat that we are seeing. We have really discovered different cases together with uh, Europol and Interpol and stuff where um, fake information has been spread within an organization. So the actual attack was not ransoming, was not data exfiltration. It was changing the way on how decision makers look at different decisions in their organization. So what attackers did in that case was that they spread information like um, an, a large company wanted to invest in either uh, market A or B, and they spread information so that the organization moved to market B. And this turned out to be, uh, to, you know, this came up later, just by happy coincidence where the, the head of controlling that, whose account was used was standing in front of somebody from the board's secretary and she was like, how did you send me an email? And he was like, I did not. And she said, I seen an email that is, you know, having corrected uh, um, KPIs, you know, business information. And they looked up if it was sent uh, from his secretary. It was not. He saw it in his outbox. And in, in this second, it disappeared. That was the only way on how they discovered that they have been addressed at broad scale uh, uh, by a fake information campaign. And this is where I think I'm personally scared about in terms of the perspective of things that we will have in the future. And there are already, last slide, and there are already things that I'll address later, uh, like the Iran search on cyber threat where um, attackers claim to have, you know, different um, uh, CCTV um, infrastructure and, and, you know, something big has changed. The report I will explain in the second session. But this is where, uh, you know, the next level of AI. So don't think about uh, the, the emoted uh, mutation with AI, but really uh, think about bigger things that are, f that are, that are coming up um, afterwards. And, and, and keep in mind that we didn't really solve the CEO fraud, and we also didn't, uh, you know, do a very good job in educating our users to detect phishing emails. So that's super basic stuff, and we fall apart. And, and I think if we are facing stuff like that, uh, the whole thing is going to be even more challenging. All right, I hope um, 
you uh, liked the presentation. Uh, looking forward to hopefully see you guys in the second one uh, and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. Okay. Am I allowed to take questions or is the time over? I have time, cool. Questions? Oh yeah, cool. Uh, Microsoft. Microphone, yeah. Mic. Yeah, thank you. Uh, you already uh, mentioned that the AI is not there yet. And now my question comes, uh, do you see it taking over the level one SOC analyst role in the future or maybe now? I said that to, to Microsoft, uh, I, I had the pleasure to be on the Redmond campus in March for the MEP summit and we had a C-level conversation and I said, if your tool is not taking over these pretty stupid tasks like the email thing that I mentioned earlier, the tool is worthless. It is already too, way too expensive, uh, which is, by the way, because Microsoft is not able to bring in the compute power. That's the only thing. They're kind of you know, having a shortage because they're not able to scale. Uh, but um, if the tool is not really bringing a solution for this, we will definitely uh, be screwed because uh, attackers are already using it. And I hope and I think it must go in that direction. It is not there yet. Um, it's also uh, a pretty political game. And by the way, I saw, see already people going out, please use the feedback cards. I, I signed that and I forgot to tell. Um, um, it is not, is not here yet, which is also a political thing because Imagine Microsoft disrupting an attack um, that was false, uh, and then you know all the competitors would would make a big, big thing out of it. But obviously, they also need fails um, by solving these incidents. Okay, thank you. And one more question: sure. You already mentioned uh, LLM poisoning. Uh, my question now is: Do you blindly trust the? the output of yeah, any AI-related yeah. uh, tool. Yeah, we all know, I think, that this is the, that this is the worst that uh, in terms of the d development can go. That um, the problem with large language models and their hallucination is that they must respond. We would not want a solution, although it might be better, that says, sorry, I can't answer that question because I don't know. And this is the problem that developers are in. And I think with, with every language model, we've seen some major fuck-ups in terms of, uh, you know, there, there was, a, I love the, the thing about the dating app where really uh, the, the developers had to turn it off because it, it was going too deep um, that people really, you know, fall into this uh, AI thing. And, and uh, because of the regulation, they had to turn it off because it was, you know, um, exaggerating or it was uh, getting over the, the borders of uh, the ethical um, understanding of, of what uh, AI is allowed to do. But, uh, yeah, the, the problem is um, that we will not be able to uh, verify it in a minute um, where we get the result. And especially with um, people like myself being very uneducated in different things. So I know nothing about Python scripting, for example. So I, I definitely would take the result and, and put it in the, in the console where I would like to have it because I'm not capable of reading what, what is written there. And this is, I think, comparable to what we're having as results for other things. But uh, um, I think it's the same with TI in the future. Um, I mean, our SOC and, and many other SOCs, I think, on the planet are the same. I'm not um, trusting just one TI feed, but also two. And maybe we can, with the logic apps and, and automation things coming in, have a verification of the results before we put them in. But the, the point that you're making is obviously one of the strongest pain points of the whole approach. Also, um, when we have these private GPTs that the guy on LinkedIn was talking about, and we want to define who is allowed to invest, uh, to, 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 to ingest, sorry, ingest truth in the model. 
So how are we learning the model, right? Is everybody that is providing context information training the model, or is, just, is there just one channel that is allowed to feed in information to educate the on-prem or the private GPT model? So there's a lot to be discovered. I don't have any answers, but these are my thoughts. <laughs> there was a question over here, I think, no? Okay, cool. Hi. Hi. Uh, great presentation. Thank I have you. a question related to deepfake and uh, AI and the all media created via AI. Mm -hmm. Do you have any tool available at this moment in SOC in order to automatically read some metadata or to have a level one analysis if it was created by AI or by whom? Yeah, I actually do have, um, um, we have even a list uh, because we, we did, in the, in the beginning we started, you know, with blocks and, and discovered that <laughs> our smart guys were just, you know, adding uh, JetGPT content to their blocks <laughs> to blow them up a little bit, which got me pretty mad because my understanding of a blog post is different, so we used zero, zero, uh, GPT zero, sorry, um, and and this brought us into the thing of you know uh, um, adding additional feeds to the list. I will share. I don't know. Are you guys more on X or on LinkedIn? Is there any, anything else that you guys are on? I will share a list afterwards after the presentation. Tag it with the, okay, <laughs> time. Um, tag it with the with the um, with the tag and uh, uh, and uh, we'll share the, the. That's a good idea, and I will definitely bring it up in the next uh, presentation. Uh, this means I'm done, right? This, yeah. One last question, if there is any. Cool. One last question. One order is number. Last question. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, that's. Oh yeah. That's a good question. Yes. Thank you for you know, covering me at that point. <laughs> you mentioned about the prospect of uh, using, uh, of running those uh, generative AI engines mm -hmm. on uh, local computers. Mm -hmm. So what's, what's your take or comments on uh, the configuration of the hardware infrastructures? Should it be, I don't know, mostly GPU related, CPU or hybrid or maybe some other solution? I think I know way too less to answer that question. I think the trend is going um, towards GP, uh, GPUs, uh, but I know nothing um, in terms of advantages of different models or different approaches. Sorry, that's just not my domain. It's an interesting discussion, and let's have that on offline. I'm really interested to learn. All right, th guys, thanks for staying with me. Thanks for the questions. Please uh, put a feedback thing. <laughs>